uh, we're second half of the uh, uh, program that Ed Grimsley and Bob Oliver are putting on. Uh, Wait a minute, your name's first. I just I, said it, Grimsley. I don't Grimsley. Want to be shot first. I want if anything I want to hear. All right, and get Bob Bob get Oliver's on. been shot at equally, and we'll take the uh, the heading here. Sean yes. Cameron. He's a veteran, and I'm a veteran of sorts. Oh, good. Oh, I'm a veteran. I'm a veteran. <laughs> no. He's a lion no. sack crap. Yes. This is for my father. God bless you. God bless you, too. <laughs> he yeah, gave back. God's going to bless him <laughs> less. When, when he comes back, I have news for you. When, when the guys come back now and the women... I have to tell you, this is from my favorite veteran. Uh, her name happens to be Katie. Not correct, she's a veteran too, but her name is Macaulay, and she is fabulous. You should see her. She looks great in that uniform, and she actually goes to those strange places that I wouldn't go to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a coward. <laughs> well, Bob is too. I oh, know, I'm, I'm a total <laughs> coward. She actually knows that somebody like me would say, oh, so you didn't think that a little girl that was adopted didn't know who her parents were. She was a redhead and everything. She looked just like her father. Yeah. And by the way, he worked for Borden's in Florida, the milk company. Mm. And, you know, they have Essie, the, the cows. And people didn't understand here in the United States of America because. I uh, again, we have two cameras rolling today. So for the benefit of the audience, uh, we are uh, at about. Uh, We're 510 on June 16th, I believe, or is it 15th? June 16th, please, Sunday, please don't look at the Radisson Hotel in Los Angeles. Mr. Ed Grimsley, Bob Oliver. And uh, <coughs> where we left off, I want to go back about 10 minutes ago. Where we left off was uh, Ed talking about his mother being uh, basically held hostage at the hotel, or at the, uh, yeah, they call it a hotel where they don't give you any care or any, no, any services. Living. Yeah. Well, I started the program by mentioning my female partner who was 80 years old um, uh, and who had a mild stroke and passed She's away. A partner in a radio show. Radio show. Uh, Carol Austin, and she was known as the psychic mom. Uh, <coughs> Carol, right at the end of uh, October, had a stroke, was put in the Monterey Community Hospital where she lived to a ripe old age of five days in care. And just like in uh, Ed's mother's case, she was dehydrated. She was not allowed to drink water. She was not given any food. Not that they brought in fo food and let it get cold. She was not given any food for five days. She was put on an IV drip. That was the only sustenance that she was given. On the first, second... The first day, wasn't the second day? And then they stopped it? On the first, second, and third day. That's correct. She, they, they actually took her off the IV for the last uh, three days of her life. They had her on heavy morphine doses... Uh, I spoke with the doctor that was attending who knew that this was extremely a procedure that was not n normal, and they basically murdered her. That's blunt and to the point. Just like in Ed's case with his mother, his mother was dehydrated, not being given food, and he was already told she's going to die here. But if you take her home, we'll get you for murder. The murder is happening on the other end. Ed was trying to care for his mother. The situation, my situation, is what I'm going to talk about now with Carol Austin in the hospital. I had a clergy group that I was a part of. I asked them to pray. I asked if they would come to the hospital. Many of them did. I was told it would be very difficult 
if possible, for me to uh, to prevent the murder of this woman. We don't use the word murder, but in a real sense, that's what this was. Termination. It's a termination. We would have to. I'd have to go along with that. That that's a, a word that's a hundred percent accurate. This was a termination of a life. It was simply accomplished by allowing uh, the the son and the daughter, the two family members that had legal custodianship, if a situation like this were to occur. That trusting her own kids. She trusted her she own kids. Said, but she did not. She signed out that she did not want to be put on a life support system to make her breathe, make her do all this type of stuff. And so then they take that and then they modify that we don't have to keep you alive. Well, we're talking. And Go ahead, Dick. And, and there it is. Rules, regulations manipulated so that the government can let you die with the help of the rest home or the hospital. And then if you have any money, any houses, then there's income taxes owed because they get their share of your property. They get their share of your real estate, money, whatever. And if the kids inherited a half a million dollars, Uncle Sam's getting his share. See, and the kids are, uh, are, are presented with this obstacle. You know, we might be able to keep your, your heading up. Okay, thank you. We we can't hear you, but uh, we'll 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 open this up for uh, questions and answers. If you'd like to stay, if you'd like to stay, we'll we'll be glad to talk with you about it. Uh, the, there are several points here that we want to make, including giving a substance 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 um, to this issue. We're going to explain what you need to do what might actually work as opposed to what happened in this situation. Carol was in the hospital on the first and second day doing this. Well, you can't see it without me standing up, but she was doing calisthenics with her hand on her knee, doing pushing motions to maintain her muscle tone. She was rubbing the, her neck and her arms and doing obviously presenting to the nursing staff that she wasn't giving up. This was massaging her body, keeping it in shape. And she had her intelligence and she had... Totally. When she came, when I came into the room, because we were partners and she was glad to see me, here's a woman that's diagnosed as not being able to speak because of her, uh, her stroke. stroke from two days, uh, the day before. She says, Bob! And when she would try to speak, the nurse and the children are saying, no, Mom, don't try to speak. Don't try to get up. Don't try to do this. Don't be alive anymore. And after the third day, the kids were kind of restless, and they left me with her mom, their mom. And I uh, took the opportunity to go up to Carol and and speak with her and try to engage her where everybody was saying no no don't mom don't talk don't say anything don't just let it be they're trying to shut her up shut her up and so i went to her and i said carol you know this isn't necessarily my place but i have to ask because i'm very concerned about your medical care that you're getting right now are you happy with the medical care that you're getting? Is this, it seems that they're just going to let you die. I, I know that they have no specialists coming in. You're not being fed. You're not allowed to drink water. I've seen this before in the Terry Schiavo case where I spent probably 1,500 hours on that case to try to understand what all was going on. And I said, Carol, are you concerned about your medical health? And she went, 
And I said, well, I don't know if you want me to get involved, but I will. Do you want me to get involved for you? And she nods her head again. And I said, all right, then you have to help me out here. I need to know in no uncertain terms that you want me to be involved and see what I can do to get this turned around. Is that what you want? And she said, yes, again, by nodding. So I said, okay, then you're going to have to show me that we're communicating. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and you have to s answer me in no uncertain terms. Carol, do you want to live? And Carol reached up with her good arm because her other right side was partially paralyzed. She put it on her head, and she grabbed her hair, and she went, Big yes, time, yes, I want to live four times. And I said, well, okay, I, I think I can understand that. That's not a, that seems like pretty apparent. So then I guess I just have one more question. Do you want to die? And she reached up, put her hand on her head, and she went. And I said, okay, I got it. I'll get involved. So I went to the heads of the Monterey Community Hospital. I went to all of the different agencies. I went to these different groups that are supposedly there to help you when you get in a situation. Alliance on the Aging, Elderly Abuse, all of these different agencies. I told the hospital what had happened. I told the head nurse. I told the family members. And eventually, I only had one place left that I could go to, which was law enforcement. So I filed a written affidavit, about 12 pages, and submitted it to Monterey Police Department. The police officer who took the report had also had a similar situation with the community hospital with his father. Many, many people that I've talked to before and since then have had similar situations where people have died in the care of the hospitals. Nobody was able to help. Nobody was able to prevent this from happening. Here was a woman who stated that she wanted to live. She wanted help, and she never got it. They forced her to die. They restricted her intake. No water, no food. They took away her IV, the only thing that was sustaining her. This is murder. And they said that because I had not filmed it, which is what we're doing now after the fact, we're filming this, you saw Carol's hand on her head saying, yes, I want to live. And Carol's hand on her head saying, no, I don't want to die. And I took this information to the authorities. And they let her die. They murdered her. Now, if I went and said I saw somebody steal an apple, they would arrest them. There would be a trial. I would be a witness. If I say my banker stole $75 out of my account, they would laugh. There would be no trial. But when we heard four years, six years ago now, five years ago, about death panels during the Obama administration, the beginning of the Obama administration, the end of the Bush administration. And we were told, well, we've looked into it. No, there's no death panels. I know there's death panels, Ed. Isn't I, that a death panel? I'm not Isn't that sure. part of the martial law? I believe it could be, but unless I know 100% what I'm talking about, I'm not going to talk about it, so you tell it. All right. Well, I'm telling you it tell the way it, I understand it, the way I believe it. agree with what I believe, okay? And I've pretty much said it because I went the extra miles to prevent the death of this woman. I worked 24-7 for like five days. I went to the Monterey Police, filed that affidavit. I went to the uh, – and they went that night – 
at 12.30 in the morning when I fi filed it. This was the last attempt that I made to save her life. I'll, they witness, went I'll witness that because I was telephoning and working with you and the things that you were trying to do to get them to feed her or give her fluids and you were being ignored and I will verify that 100%. And I was at the hospital with you once, visited her, and I says, do you want to live? Do you want me to try to help you? And she went, yeah, yes, try to help me. Kind of not speaking, but doing it. And, and for your efforts, I want people to understand that right from the get-go, this man was thrown out. How, we don't know you, said the two. The daughter was actually the one. But The son said nothing bad against me. He wouldn't say anything one way or another. And the daughter says, I don't know who you are, and you're not part of my family. What gives you the I, right? And why are you trying to get my mother fed and fluid? Leave it be. I told the nursing staff that they wanted me to throw out of the hospital and Carol understood, and she was sitting there shaking her head. No, don't make him leave. And when I had asked her once again, do you want me to stay and help you? And she shook her head, yes. And the daughter insisted that we left. Well, I hope that that daughter just Careful. got to spend all of her mother's money wisely. That's all I can say. I never researched it in, in that area. So this isn't a study. This is just a statement. And we, um, or I, did as much as I could at the time for Carol. So I'm putting this video out so that you know what you would have to go through. You would not only have to have a witness with you. But you would have to have a witness and you would have to tape it. And then maybe they'll come up with some other reason for letting her die. Now, Carol was a psychic. Carol knew things. Carol was demonstrating things to other people like myself. Now, the last uh, conference that we had, uh, well, or one of the conferences that we had with David Farman uh, earlier this year, I think February, March, I was a speaker and I brought information out and I was electronically molested up on the stage after saying this statement. I brought out that we channeled through Carol and I had the opportunity to speak with beings presumably out on a spaceship a being who reported that he was something like 700 years old. And I was able to ask some questions. And so there were two pertinent questions to what Ed and I do that I asked. One was, tell me about UFOs and how I can best understand what's going on here, this experience that we're having with extraterrestrials, UFOs on the planet. Now the answer that was channeled back through Carol was watch the movies Men in Black and I asked Carol do you, have you ever seen these movies? She said no I said do you know anything about these movies? She said no so we checked out the movies and we watched them together so that's something you could do the movies Men in Black probably have 70 to 90 percent information that's viably true about how this is all set up Second question I asked was, I want to know who's most responsible for 9-11. How do we put this in a perspective where we can reach out to people and give them an intuitive understanding? Those weren't my exact words, but that was my intention in asking the question. Who's most responsible for 9-11? And the answer was Alan Greenspan, head of the Federal Reserve. Now, this is information that was channeled in 2007, just before Carol's death. And while I was on stage explaining this, we had a room full of people, and somebody zapped me. And let me tell you what that feels like if it's a warning. It feels like you have to throw up and take a bowel movement, have a bowel movement at the same time. 
And I literally commented on that in my video, which then turned out not to have any audio on it. It was erased. It was erased. But I definitely was molested on stage electronically, and that's the definition that I give you, molestation electronically. There are lots of people that claim that this is happening to them on a daily basis. This happened to me the one time I've never experienced those exact sensations or that intense before, other than to say it attacks what I believe is would be called your sexual chakra areas. That seemed to be the gut and where I could feel it, and it was excruciating. I continued to do the lecture. But let's talk briefly about Alan Greenspan, the head of the Federal Reserve, and who would be most responsible is who is control of the money in the money. And if you go back and you're doing the kinds of study that we have done through the years, you learn the nature and the history of the Federal Reserve and how it creates debt out of money and continues to perpetually put individuals and countries further and further in debt through inflation and contraction of economies, which is what we're experiencing, what's going on right now, and why we've had all of these bubbles and how we're being manipulated financially. So Carol, getting back to Carol, I went to the hospital. I went to all of these different agencies. How does that fall out? How does that manifest. Okay, after going to these agencies, I went back. Several of them made attempts to talk with Carol and found that she was asleep and they did not go back. But the reason she was asleep was that she was now on heavy doses of morphine that were killing her. The police had the final say-so in this issue as to whether this was electron or, uh, elder abuse. That's the only way I could file these charges against the hospital as elder abuse charges, much like Ed, but I was not a family member. So we're fighting for the life of an individual. The police department eventually fills out their police report, but Carol died two days later in the hospital. The police were unable or unwilling to do anything, so it did not manifest that her life was saved through the police department it only manifested that the last hours were waged and Carol passed on. The police report, however, exists. And what the police report says, predominantly what it says is Carol Austin and Bob Oliver believe in UFOs. Therefore, they're crazy. We're going to let this transpire. That's in writing. But what's in reality is that six years ago when Ed Grimsley first came to my attention and said you can see UFOs with night vision goggles, you could Google UFOs and night vision goggles and you got zero hits. Nobody had film footage up there saying you can see UFOs with night vision goggles. And over five years, what we have manifested over two million hits from zero to two million in five years. And that yeah. police report is going to stand as evidence that what we said is real and what they did is an illusion and part of the martial law that they maintain in this country. And, you know, uh, I've got a lot of people that are following what I suggested and showed the world how to do and it was worth doing and it's the truth and if I don't tell you it might take longer but you need to see the truth you need to speak the truth you need to make sure that they stop hiding the truth from you and find out who the human race is and what you're all about 
and do not surrender and give up to them because they're not here for you in the way you want to be. What they're doing is taking over planet Earth and human race and I believe there are good aliens and bad aliens, there's many types, but I believe some of our government is working with aliens, and I believe the aliens have manipulated our government and are working to take us over, and when they take our guns, they can drop in, and they can do more to you because if they've lived for thousands of years... Millions, millions. Space, they're not wanting to. T they're not wanting to take around and cause them their life. But I don't know why they would have the right to come and take ours, or use the hybrid programs to take us over. And all I can say is that you damn well better wake up because it's getting dark, and you need to turn the lights on for yourself and understand the things that are happening is against all of mankind and not just one of mankind and you need to learn the truth organize get a citizens alliance set up stand up against corrupt government and i and i'm gonna i'm basically gonna end it right now because i'm burning out here all right i'm gonna finish the program and i'm gonna give you ideas on what you actually can do and what's being done in our own Community. So I'm going to let Captain Bob take over the ship for a while and keep you out in the twilight zone. This is Mr. Ed Grimsley, and would you like to give out your phone number, please? Well, it's 707-478-2540, and anybody in the world can call me. I'd just like to be a decent hour. Uh, all my websites and coast to coast radio shows and everything it's all willing it's all there but I do like to sleep too because I am part human and I don't know how much part but in turn you need to basically respect me and if you need goggles you need information I'm willing to talk to you and please wake up get off your bottoms and help the world. It needs it. Thank right. you. Thank you, Mr. Ed Grimsley. <coughs> so, what can we do? Well, the first thing that we have to do if you want to be effective is you have to wake up. You have to begin learning the truth from the lie. So, you have to change your whole posture on how you live. You don't need to watch the television, listen to the radio where you're being lulled back to sleep, uh, go get a good meal, uh, get another job. This kind of stuff is not how we're going to come out of this. Ed stated about taxes. At some point, maybe we will decide not to pay taxes anymore. That'll certainly take a bite out of them and get their attention. They can't come after all of us, but we can all stand up for each of us. That's been proposed many ways. Now, let's say that you're like this woman who I've been describing, the homeless woman, eight years homeless, living in her car, no problems, no tickets. All of a sudden, she's uh, fighting the court over a ticket, a ticket that says that she's wasted an officer's time. We say he was wasting her time. It was a bogus pullover. 1219 at night, they're looking for a $100,000 ticket. That's a DUI. That's a, that's a gift for their quota. Now, the city of Monterey in 2000, 1999-2000, had the highest rate of drunk driving arrests and convictions in the state. city of 30,000 people. It's in San Francisco, L.A., well, how could that be? Well, because all of the drunk driving laws and procedures came out of the Monterey Peninsula and Monterey County court system to create this huge revenue source and another form 
not only of taxation, but another form of martial law. This is a tool to maintain martial law over us. Better not get caught driving in Monterey after 9 o'clock. You're most likely to get pulled over for a variety of false reasons to check to see if you've been out drinking because it's a $100,000 ticket. That's the average cost that it's going to cost your family, possibility of, of uh, ruining your family, causing a divorce, losing your job, uh, losing the ability to finish putting your kids through college, whatever. It's huge of a financial issue. Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, a great organization when it was started by the mother who I believe it was her daughter who was killed. But that organization, like all of the organizations that were meant to help, have been taken over by groups that then do just like what's been done with this drunk driving arrest. They keep lowering the amount of alcohol you can have in your system, which keeps raising the number of pullovers and court cases they can create. It's an extraction process. It's just like more parking meters and more types of parking meters that are harder to read. Harder to read but create more tickets that you just can't fight. I'm fighting four parking tickets in a six week period. Two of them down here in Southern California. You go to a convention, four cars go park by the beach. You're looking at the signs, okay, it looks good here. You come back 20 minutes later and all four cars have a ticket on a $75 ticket for parking near the beach after 10 o'clock. Now, this kind of abuse is something that has to be fought. We're not stupid. The rules and regulations, the way they're written, are written to trick us. And then the court system to intimidate us. They don't want you to play. They want you to pay. Give us the money and then go have fun. Go out to dinner. Enjoy life. And maybe you'll park in another spot and we'll get you again. Because we have so many ways of getting you. So briefly, we want to talk about tickets. In Monterey, for example, if you're going down a one-way street and you park on the left hand of the street, side of the street, looking for a parking spot, you pull over and you look at the curb, you're looking for a little line on the curb that says your wheels are parked behind the line. But oftentimes there'll be three parking spaces that don't have that little line. So your eyes don't spot it, so you go, well, I must be in the correct place or you don't choose to look because you think that your parking lane is a little wide open but maybe your your car is actually a foot over the line that's on the right which you can't see you have to get out and physically look but you fail to do that so now you're taking up two parking spaces there is a set of three parking spaces just like what I have described on a busy day the police come down that way, they look, they generally get one to two people who have been forced because one car forces the next car, which forces the next car because there's no line along that curve. So they might pick up three tickets. In a space of 30 feet, you have two signs. One sign says, uh, no parking restrictions from on, on uh, Saturday or Sunday. The other sign says parking restrictions Monday through Saturday. So you look at the one that says no parking on Saturday and Sunday and you park 30 feet away where the sign says, oh yeah, but we do ticket on this side of the street on Saturdays. Get a ticket. Little things the way they're worded. New meters that are set up on Fisherman's Wharf in Monterey. You've got to go pretty long distance to find the money to put into their 
electronic meter. You might have to go ask a restaurant for the money, change a $20 bill. By the time you come back, somebody's already marked your car with a ticket. They're hungry. They want your money. Another problem with uh, electronic metering now. We're down in L.A. This meter says, you go look at it. It says, uh, put, put the money in. You put the money in, and up comes this thing that tells you what you're putting the money in for. And then the message goes away, so you keep putting the money in. But if you don't look back, you don't realize that a second message comes up. Then that one goes away. Then a third message comes up, and that one goes away. And by the time you read all three messages, you go, oh, wait a minute. It's not saying what it said in the beginning. It's contradicting that and saying something totally different. Five parking spaces. You come out the next morning, there's four tickets in five parking spaces. Now, that's a pretty good revenue. Are we stupid? No. These meters are designed to create this mental confusion that you don't understand until after you get the ticket. These are unclear. These are illegal. This is part of what Ed Grimsley was saying, how our Constitution is being taken away from us and that there's treason involved here. If nothing else, this is city corruption. This is parking programs in which the people that go out and monitor these particular spots and write the tickets, they know which spots they're going to monitor. This is a form of entrapment. It would be like framing somebody. They didn't know. But all of a sudden, they're part of this whole issue. Now, stuff like this is going on constantly. There's just so much of it. You know, this is becoming a long video. But it's important that you grasp some of these cases. The parking issues are just unreal. Unreal because, for example, we have a councilman, Jeff Hofferman in Monterey, who got a ticket for running a red light. The only thing is, or it's not a red light, it was a stop sign. Problem is, there was two stop signs. One is illegally placed in front of a red light, signal light, and they're within 30 feet of one another. So you come up to these two stop signs to make a right-hand turn as you're coming off the freeway. And, you know, as you're coming off the freeway, the traffic is behind you, and it's moving at a pretty, pretty fast pace. So when you come up to this right-hand turn where they want you to stop abruptly and then make the right-hand turn, you're in fear that you're going to get nailed from behind by the car that's coming off the freeway from behind you. So most people roll through that stop. If there was a yield sign there, it wouldn't be illegal. But they have a stop sign, and they have a police officer hanging out by that stop sign to write you a ticket. And as I said, most people don't stop. And I mean most in this case, it's 90, I think it was 96% of the people don't stop. So that's 10 out of 10, or 96 out of 100 that don't stop. So everybody gets a ticket. So if a police officer's there and sees you coming off the freeway and go around that curve, he can take his eyes off of you and look back and then go, pull you over because he knows you didn't stop. Nobody stops. The police officers have a name for a place like this. The, the patrol parking meter people have the same name for a place like this because it is where they go get their quota of money, quota of tickets. It is something that they call a sweet spot. Now, if you were to get them on the stage, remember, because the court is a stage, and you were to examine them, cross-examine them, and ask them, what is a sweet spot? They would lie to you. Never heard of it. They're lying under oath, and they're city officials. They're part of the city official network of city employees, of family not getting into the issue of nepotism here. But they will lie in court. 
Hmm. Never heard of that before. Don't know what a sweet spot is. But if you know a few police officer or uh, patrol officers, uh, parking patrol officers, say, hey, come on, talk to me, talk to me. On the QT, sweet spot. Oh, don't, don't bring that up. No, come on, tell me. You know what it is. Tell me. what it, what's this? Come on, tell me what it is exactly. Uh, you know. We know that it's a place. You know it's a place. You know. What tell me. No, I want to hear it out of your mouth. It's where we go to get a quota of our tickets so we don't have to work so hard. We know we're going to pick up a ticket there. Come on, Bob, you know. You're smart. But how do we get this information out to the rest of the public? Took five and a half years to get the internet when you googled UFOs and night vision goggles and got zero hits five years ago it took over five years to get us up to we now have two million hits so it's up to you watching this video to go out go to a city council meeting in your hometown and say what's a sweet spot and watch your city officials do this in their seat And now I got a cramp in my leg, so we're going to have to shorten this video. But the point is just that. Um, it's all corruption. They know it. Ed, you net us out of here pretty quick? Thanks. And there is something you can do about it, and that's what you do. You confront these people. You go back to the next week and say, gee, you know, I was talking about sweet spots uh, two weeks ago. Nobody seemed to know anything about it. Do you know anything about it now? Did you, did you guys ask around? You're on the city council. Did you check with the police chief? Did you check with the uh, patrol officers? And watch them slink into their seat again because they're all corrupt. I ran for mayor of Monterey in 2000, 2002, 2004. In the 2000 election, we know that George Bush was not elected. Well, most of us, I think, are beginning to understand this. George Bush was not elected president. He was appointed by the Supreme Court. We're not having free elections. We are having appointments. And it's been going on for a long time. Kennedy was the last elected official. John F. Kennedy. And he was elected by popular vote because he cheated and got the number of votes on paper that won the election. And it was so close anyway. And I like Kennedy. He was my president. Eisenhower was my president, but I was only eight. I almost was a voting age while Kennedy was in office. So the 2000 election, we had a president that was appointed, not elected. Al Gore actually had the number of votes to win it, but he wasn't appointed. The election was stolen by the Bush family and the Supreme Court that the Bush family had appointed. And Al Gore was not supposed to win the election. That's why he backed off. George Bush was supposed to be president. Now, John F. Kennedy Jr. died the year before George Bush became president. Like his father, he was murdered by the Bushes. Think about it. Had John Kennedy Jr. been alive during the aftermath of 9-11, he would have run for public office for the presidency in 2004. And he would have been elected because his father was the president who fought the Nazis, George Bush family that Ed was talking about, who had dealings with the Nazis during World War II under Prescott Bush, who was the head of Union Bank. Now. John Kennedy, Jr., would not have sat still without being vocal. He would have gotten the nomination against George Bush. He would have told this country that we had no business being in two illegal wars. 
but he was murdered a year before George Bush was put in office. You think about that, and you'll figure out that the reason for that was that 9-11 was already planned. That was a government that planned that. It was going to happen, and John Kennedy Jr. had to die because of it. He was probably what you could call the first casualty of 9-11, two years ahead of it. Carol Austin channeled that the name you would most be remembering would be Alan Greenspan. When we first channeled that information or asked for that information, we were told it was too dangerous for us to have it. The space beings or however this ultimately works said, we'll look into it and when it's safe, we'll tell you. I think it's safe now. Carol Austin died at the hands of a death panel in Monterey. We were told that it was safe to have the information. All the information that I've discussed is available out on the internet for you to look at. But more, or, mo more over, I witnessed things at, in the news the night that John Kennedy's plane and crashed and the following day that indicated even to me back in 1999 that he had been murdered by our government. Stories that came out over the air that were not justified. For example, if you go back and you look at film footage or remember just turning the channel back and forth, every channel at the same time saying poor spoiled rich kid kills wife and unborn infant. How can each channel have that very same story going on at once. That's someone's opinion or that's propaganda going out over the news. And what is propaganda? Well, it's called public relations. And what is it in the form of a newscast? Well, it's a form of public relations in which we're supposedly getting the truth. But do we ever get the truth? No, we live in a total lie. Go online and look up if you can see UFOs with third generation night vision goggles and you can, then everything else is a lie. Go online and look up what ought not be is and what ought be must be. You'll be amazed because of how many hits you're going to get on a statement like that. Millions of hits. Because there's a consciousness that's displayed over the internet that when you say things a certain way, they have power. Things are being said in certain ways where they have power that's picked up over the internet and it, you can Google these things and they begin to make sense. Is the internet a good thing or a bad thing? Was 9-11 a good thing or a bad thing? How could 9-11 be a good thing? Several thousand people died in those towers. Many of them jumped to their deaths. How could any of this be a good thing? Yet, it's an experiential thing. And if we're here to experience all of this, then can't all of this be a good thing as opposed to all of this being a terrible thing, bad thing, evil thing? Now, in the case of 9-11, What's my justification for suggesting that it's a good thing? We live in a total lie today. Yet people are waking up to the idea that 9-11 was an inside job. If they wake up to that, just maybe they'll keep looking until they see the entire lie that we've been living and how we've been living our entire lives in a lie. And so that is what I believe the silver lining. And that things, 
I can't tell you how they're going to turn out, but I can tell you to take action. They might take out, turn out better than they're turning out right now if you take action. Fight your parking tickets. Stand up for a poor woman who's been molested, in a sense, by a city who doesn't want to deal with its homeless issue. A woman who's been no problem for anybody, no police problem, no ticketing, no tickets. Eight years as a homeless person, she's been able to get by. And now she's got to be in court where they want to turn her into a victim of police officers who are lying. Of a system that looks for drunk driving arrests and at one point in around 1999-2000 had roughly 600 drunk driving arrests and convictions in that year. And after that, nearly the same number until about 2006 where the number started dropping because people don't want to get a DUI in Monterey. And it's not that they're out drunk and incapable of driving, it's that there's a law that says you can only have so much alcohol in your system. And so they've lowered that law twice now, I believe, and they want to do it again because each time they lower the law, that drunk driving arrest rate goes back up to a higher level because there's more potential and so there are people in Monterey who work late at night. They're working. They're not drinking. And they're going home late at night. And they get pulled over sometimes three and four times a week, once a night, because the police are that intent on getting their quota of drunk driving arrests and getting that Yahoo $100,000, which is what it costs the average person. So if you're aware of this and you make others aware of it and you fight these laws, you say, no, we enjoy people going out and having a drink now and then. This goes on and on and on and on. You have to think of your own stories, ones that you never followed through on to begin to see this lie, to begin to understand that we're at war with our own government right now and they are keeping us in prisons of the mind and I think I'm going to conclude now with this statement for you to ponder and understand and to begin to understand. What is a robot? A robot is a slave that is forgotten that he is a slave. And we're all slaves. But many of us are like robots and we go out for that paycheck and we'll take that second job and get more money and eventually we'll have enough where things start to work for us, but they never quite do. So we live in a financial system in which they control inflation, depressions, and eventually they get it all. Like in Ed's case, where his mother's in, in uh, jail, in the hospital and they make her sign away her home and they won't let her out of the hospital and what Ed had to do to uh, convince them otherwise. What I attempted to do to get Carol medical help. See all of these systems we have the industrial military complex. Okay. Oh yeah I, we all know that one. We have the prison industrial complex. We also have many other industrial complexes, including the medical industrial complex and the pharmaceutical industrial complex. And the way these things work, each and last one of them, is they need customers. I know some of you out there in the audience are nodding off right about now. But they need customers. The parking patrol people need customers. So they generate customers in the parking division by creating parking spots that don't work for you. You don't understand why you're getting the tickets. Medical. 
where you'd understand why they're letting you die in the hospital because they're taking your home. Ed's mother's home on the on the chopping block. They we're going to let her die. Ed takes her home. She's fine. And on and on. They're all designed. They're working against us right now. We are customers of the very systems that were set up to protect and serve us. We're now customers. I don't mind being a customer of a supermarket or of a motorcycle shop, but I don't want to be a customer of a hospital that has to make me sick in order to have me come back. Thank you. Stay active and stay well.